Loch Arrow is a natural limestone lake, no ordinary lake. Irish limestone lakes, like English chalk streams, have very clear water and a great richness of living things, including wild brown trout and the queen of all trout flies, the mayfly. Mayflies start hatching in the unpredictable weather of late spring here in the northwest of Ireland, though not always in May. After years spent underwater as a nymph, the winged insect splits out of its shuck and flies to the shelter of the bushes on the bank. Its days are numbered now, and its sole purpose is reproduction. At this stage in its four-part development, it's known as a dun, green drake, or green fly. But while it's hatching in the surface film of the lake, it's very vulnerable to attack. There are several ways of catching trout when they're feeding on mayfly. One of the earliest signs that the hatch is starting on the western lakes is the sight of long dapping rods sprouting from the boats. They're using blow lines and the natural insect. But first, catch your natural insects. Paul Cullen's luckier than most because he owns a cottage on an island in the lake which he and his Springer Spaniel can use as a base for the mayfly hunt. The flies have been blown in here, right down from Dodds Bay, from the bog banks, which is a very shallow bay, out of Brickeen, and they've all collected on this high hawthorn hedge here in front of the house. Which is thick with them. And you'll notice they're on the underside of the leaves, uh, where they're protected from rain or from wind. I'm just trying to pick the biggest ones. Today is a perfect dapping day. There's a nice breeze and a bit of cloud cover. I'm out with Albert, Albert Fraser, who's been dapping this lake for 50 years. And if he doesn't know all the good spots, nobody does. Yes, I always do. Most people give them uh, three or four seconds, like. In dapping, you use a fairly large hook, about size six or eight. The best place to put your hook is through the chocolate spot, which is just below the wings, behind the thorax. This, in fact, is the thickest part of the fly's anatomy. On some lakes, on Loch Reed, it gives seven seconds. Yeah. The basic idea in dapping is to skate a natural fly on the surface of the water, about 20 feet in front of the boat. To enable you to do this, you use a very long rod, 15 to 20 foot long, and you use floss silk or very light line, which will catch the wind and will billow the fly out in front of you. A lot of people call the mayfly season Duffer's Fortnight and call dapping an old woman's game. But anyone who has been out with Albert will disagree. The skill is in knowing where the fish are going to feed and being able to manoeuvre your boat well enough to cover them. With these big dapping rods, of course, a fish doesn't stand much of a chance. They're very powerful and they'll subdue a fish in no time.
Australia's in the net. And he barely hooked him the scissors. Lovely fish. Well, today we're going to have a couple of hours fishing, maybe an afternoon with Mike Tolan. Mike is a great wet fly fisherman, which differs a lot in technique from the daffin. He would fish with three flies on a cast, which gives him a better chance of meeting fish at different levels. I'm fishing a dry fly. This gives us a chance to ring all the changes if you meet a few feeding fish. The rod I'm using here for dry fly fishing is actually a nine foot rod with a slightly fast action. And the fly I'm using is a fly called a grey wolf. It looks anything but like a mayfly when you look at a mayfly. But if you would observe a mayfly hatching, you'll notice that the shuck which he's come out of very often is attached to his tail, which gives him a very elongated look. That is when the fly is at his most vulnerable. That's why if you look at a grey wolf, you'll see a long tail sticking back behind. But fish will take him ravenously during the mayfly. For years now, people used the more traditional type mayfly, which was just a yellow or a green hackle with a, say, an ivory coloured body and tails. I saw him taking two flies, and then I, I thought I'd gone by him, actually. He must have doubled back on his tracks. That's, that's fishing. Wet fly fishing is probably the most traditional manner of fishing in the west of Ireland, much more so than the dry fly. Mike is drawing his flies across the foam line where the natural flies will have collected and where feeding fish will concentrate. And on the cast of three flies, he'll be fishing with, I would say, a mayfly nymph on the, would be a good choice for the bottom fly, and uh, maybe a golden olive or an invicta or something like that, which would represent a hatching mayfly in the middle. And then on the top fly, most people would use uh, a bushy bob fly, which he would bob to the surface. Very often, this is actually a dry fly, which is uh, oiled and is just drawn to the surface to make a wake which could represent a hatching mayfly to a fish, or one just after hatching. Uh, and in fact, very, very, very often, uh, a trout will actually be attracted to the bob fly and will turn around and take one of the other two flies. It's, uh, it's a great attract to the bob fly. I know, Michael, uh, you're drawing those wet flies very slowly. Yes, I like to fish a floating line, and I the chopped off her, and bob it before I lift it off the water. Oh, beauty. Good man, Mike. A beauty.
remember, oh, I suppose four or five years ago, we had very, very calm, sunny weather, and we were having great difficulty getting the fish to take our spent net. When a friend of mine, Barry Cook, came up with the idea of putting on a latex body onto a fly. And uh, we came up with this fly, which we actually called the copy dex mayfly. It's a simple enough procedure. You just get three, three or two or three strands of pheasant tail, or dog hair, anything you want, anything that's stiff to use for a tail. Dip it in the glue, put it on the body, and uh, fold it up along. All during the mayfly, there's a vice permanently set up on this table here. It's one of the great advantages of living actually on the water, as we are here living on this island, is that you're so near the water, so near the boat, and if you, if you feel like tying a fly, you can just come in, walk up 50 yards, and you're in the house, and you're in your laboratory. It's a lovely old house, it's a cottage really, a small cottage. It belonged originally to a famous family of fishermen called Lytles. They were probably the most famous fishermen ever on this lake. They lived here all their lives, and they all lived to ripe old ages, well into their 90s. And one day we were doing a little bit of renovation, and I found uh, Tom Lytle's old fly wallet, which he had shoved into a little nook over the chimney. An amazing thing I found was his very innovative sedge. The sedge is a, uh, is different, he's not like the mayfly. He hatches late at night, and he scurries across the water. Tom had uh, got the idea of actually pairing a cork down the same size as the fly, and attaching it on with a piece of thread onto a hook. So he never had to oil his fly, didn't worry about it, could never sink, and uh, obviously caught a lot of fish for him. Generally, when I'm making a spent, I use, um, some people use badger hackle, but usually I blend two hackles together. I take a black hackle and a cream hackle, and uh, just wind the two of them on together. When you have them wound on a hook, they're actually in full circle. So what you do is you just split the fibres then into roughly two halves, two bunches, and uh, make a series of figure eight knots until they actually lie out sideways. This, in fact, on the water then gives the effect of a, a, a fly with his wings spread out dead on the water.
He only rose one or two, didn't he? Well, that's the fish there, just on the corner. Well, that's that's Bert, he took a fish there. Oh, the in front of us? Yeah. Bert, he took a fish there and went to go out in front of it. Well, I'll go out like this. If I got another one, I don't want. Oh, yes. <laughs> what did I get? Did we catch one last year? <laughs> <laughs> Fishers seem to have changed their habits. You know, they're not surface feeding as much as they were. I think it's the fishermen are getting out. <laughs> they're not able to put the, the elbow well, Before you fellas pa pass on, we want to hear all the old tips now before you pass on. You know Before I go out. Yeah, because I want to pass these things well, out. I'm not, I'm not going out. I'm going to stay in tonight. Now, you're going to stay in, but I mean before you pass on altogether. <laughs> you caught some good fish here, Danny. I didn't. I never got really anything very big. I had bigger ones on Sheila. You could always believe the cannons, you can never tell the lie. Right? Oh, That's right. Only, <laughs> only, only, you know, he might say the word, you know, he wouldn't say the word that size when they're only that size. Isn't that right, Cannon? <laughs> no, the best on the dry fly was seven and a quarter, and the best on the wet, seven three. That was a nice fish. Two very nice fish. They usually grow when they're a white caught, anyway. Yeah. That's right. They get no small. A year or two. Yeah. I'd say the big ones are caught over the road in the pub there. That's right. The biggest one I think caught was by old Lytle. Back yeah, just yes. off the shore Back under the house there. in that little bay there. He was eight and a quarter pound. Jack did. You remember old Jack that lived down here? He was only uh, he, he, he netted personally. the fish for him. You know, an old gilly once told me that a day spent in Loch Arrow adds a day to your life. Some of these lads here have enough days spent to live to be a hundred. Do have any luck? Oh, I did, says he. I was fishing away, says he. Let me lay down and I felt this pull, says he. And I knew I was at to getting them off the bottom anyway. And when I wound it up, I had a beautiful copper star and lantern, and it was still lit. Ah, oh, says your man, I'm not going to wear that one now. Says he, uh, well, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll compromise. You take ten pounds off the weight of the fish, and I'll blow out the light. Very good, Nick. Says the wind. Never wrong. He is a good trout. He's two pounds. And done. I knew that he was good fish. You couldn't be that long on a fish water. Now throw him out in the water to make a splash. <laughs> <laughs> now the green flies have matured and are ready for mating. The males take off, fly up in the air in an uptual dance. The females will soon join in the fun. They'll fly in low, up through the columns of males where they're seized upon and mated. There's a lot more males than females, so very often you'll see a group of males trying to mate with the same female. The females are now ready to lay their eggs, but they won't go to the water until the light level drops later on. It's more like the weather, Mike. A good friend of mine, Mike Bunn, has joined me here and we're going to do a bit of spent that fishing around the island later on. Mike, who is a great dry fly specialist, really revels in this type of spent that fishing. It was a bit windy there, so I'm going to be prepared for it. I think that uh, wind will settle down. The south breeze nearly always calms off. It does, yeah. And what strain cast are you using? I think six pounds. Normally I'd use it in a riffle, I'd use eight. Eight, eight or six. I'm using really. the same. I'm using a step down from eight to eight to six. It's, um, I think six is all right, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, you'd want that anyway if you hope good fish. Well, maybe even lighter, in bright, sunny conditions. I'm using one of your flies, the one you gave me last night, that nice big one. It'll float well in the wind, you know? Oh, yeah. That's why I'm tying it on. I'm going down to where I was fishing last night, and if the wind is up, that'll stay afloat well. Well, look, I'll give you a tip about that if you're using it. There's sheep's wool body on that, and you know how absorbent wool is. I do, yeah. So you want to oil that fly very, very well. But, uh, what, give just, it a I mean, yeah, but so what, permafly's good enough, isn't it? Well, I don't know, really, uh, because... I knew a man once in Connemara and he used to use, uh, you know, hair oil, brilliant and stuff like that. But no, I don't believe you. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> you want to see this latex body fly, don't you? I do indeed, yeah. I've heard a lot about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredibly realistic. And those, see them, you see the wings? That's a black yeah. and a cream hackle, actually, tied in together. But they're soft. You know, one's a hen hackle and one's a... You know, they're not a the soft hackle you get on some of the... The whole off. fly is very, very soft. It the is soft. Of, yeah. And the amount of hackle on that, then, it's very, you see, very soft. You don't need bristly hackles to mm. float this, because no. there's rubber body floats anyway. 
and you don't need cloth. So for instance, would you find that more successful than the type you tied last night? For me? Which is sure. much, that's much bigger than any spent I would normally tie, but I'm probably going to fish in a wave tonight, so. In a wave, you're normally drifting. Mm. So you need a, something reasonably big that you can see. Yes, yeah, sure, And yeah. you're, go you're going to get one quick strike. Yeah. Whereas in a flat calm, when think the fish are moving slowly, and the boat is stationary, yeah. always, this is the job. Even when they're shipping? They're more difficult to hook when they're shipping. You've got mm. to give them longer. But if a fish head and tails on that fly, give him a couple of seconds and he's certain. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah certain. OK, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I always bring a second rod. Yes, do you? No. No? Uh, you're going to an unmercy. Oh, you're going to an almighty tangle tonight. Don't come to me from my room. <laughs> we'll be That's different right. parts of the lake, Paul, don't we? Oh, well. I'll take the dog with me. That's bad enough. The basic idea of this type of dry fly fishing is when you see a fish rising is to try and intercept him in his feeding path with your fly and you hope then to keep your fingers crossed that he's going to take your fly rather than one of the many naturals which is on the water. The fall has now started. The females are coming out into the water to lay their eggs and die. The trout will soon be on the move. It's easily two and a half, and I think it's really deep fish. Look at the spots. As the light fades, the big fish come on the move. This is my favourite time to be on the lake. Out come the bats, the owls, and the creatures of the night. The darker it gets, the less worried the big fish become. And if there's a glimmer of light in the western sky, it's possible to fish right through till two, three o'clock, even right through till dawn. And I've often done it. As it gets darker, of course, the less you can rely on your eyesight. All your other senses become much more acute to compensate, and you start to fish by sound. Leave the rod down. Look at me, bastard, and hack Oh, Jesus. How do you have it entangled in there? Bye.